morning, everyone. Hello. Welcome back. Thank you. my coffee. My name is Carol Freeman, and uh, I'm going to start out by sharing my keto success story with you. And then after that, we'll just have volunteers, people come up and share their success story. So uh, we're here at Low Carb USA 2019, which is the fourth year that this conference has been held. Um, how, did, how many of you are first year attendees? Okay. Second year? Anybody three times? Four times? Yeah. All right, cool. We got the full representation. We've got uh, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors here today. <laughs> Um, I found keto uh, the hard way. Um, you're going to hear a lot of stories today that are inspiring and um, also, you know, if, also if you want to share too and you don't feel like, oh my gosh, I didn't have this, like, I almost, I, you know, I didn't die like some of the people's stories are going to be, it's okay because everybody's um, story is unique and it's going to inspire somebody else. And uh, we were at dinner last night with um, Tyler from Keto Games and he was talking about how you affect one person and that affects somebody else and then it's ripples and waves of people that you impact so sharing your story is really really powerful because it just is part of what's contributing to changing the world that we're in and the health of this entire planet um, so i was trained as a nutritionist uh, i have six figures in student loans to prove it uh, <laughs> I, uh, I've always been passionate about helping people be as healthy as they can, body and mind. And so I did my undergrad in nutrition and I got a very specialized master's degree in both nutrition and clinical health psychology. And I was always looking for what's the answer to help people be at a healthy body weight, but also love themselves and keep it sustainable. Um, I didn't find that in my training, although I spent probably 20 years studying psychology and all that. Um, it actually took a very uh, impactful car accident that I was in. In uh, 2014, I was rear-ended by a distracted driver that was going about 35 miles an hour. Um, and uh, I ended up disabled and bedridden the better part of a year and a half from a brain injury, uh, crush injuries to my legs. And uh, all the while, I'm getting heavier and heavier, um, sicker and sicker, and I couldn't figure out what to do. The doctors, after 172 different doctor's visits, um, they just wanted to tell me, oh, you're depressed, you have fibromyalgia, you uh, um, just get over it, you know, have positive mind, mind uh, thoughts, that's what you need to do. Um, so I went back to my own training and I thought, what do I know about nutrition that could help heal me? And I remember about this much information about a ketogenic diet as a treatment for epilepsy. And I reasoned that well, epilepsy is something that's not working quite right in the brain. Perhaps that's something would help me as well. So I started reading everything I could online and um, I became hopeful, but also cautiously optimistic. Actually, I was pretty pessimistic because I learned in school that there was no way to actually lose weight and keep it off. And that it was actually cruel to encourage people to try to lose weight because they were just gonna fail and they were gonna gain it back and then they were just gonna hate themselves even more. So I went into it doubtful that I could stick with it, um, but I also was so desperate to get out of bed. And within days, the symptoms that I had that had me bedridden were just vanishing. And all the symptoms of the brain injury, even the chronic pain syndrome that I had in my legs, which I'll, I'll mention it because some people, it's a rare thing, but some people may identify with it as chronic regional pain syndrome I was developing in my legs. And uh, this is a chronic, progressive, disabling, pain syndrome that happens, and uh, that went into remission. And so I finally had the missing piece that I've been looking for in my practice all these years to be able to provide people with this delicious, sustainable way of eating that also helps them be healthy as well. So uh, that is an abbreviated version of my success story. Um, I've been following keto now for a uh, little over four years. Um, May 18th, 2015 is my anniversary. And uh, so now um, I'd like to invite whoever brave enough to come up and share their success story. We're just going to continue and share successes. Oh. Yeah. How about failure stories? No, this is a success story <laughs> <laughs> session. No, well, you have ups and downs. Right. Well, that's the, that's the journey story. So today we're sharing 
you know, how you got to keto, what the successes you've experienced on, on that. Yeah. Mike, do you want to come up? Sure. Oh. He's a plant in the audience, so it's fine. <laughs> welcome. Michael Berta, welcome. Check, check. <laughs> hey, welcome. Where, where are you here from? I'm here from Seattle, Washington. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. He's my neighbor, so. <laughs> it's true. I could run to Carol's house in probably about 25 minutes if I needed to. But we didn't know each other before keto. We met, like, basically online group. Yes, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. yeah. All right, so share, share your story. Sure. So um, I was pretty normal weight growing up, and then all of a sudden uh, I turned 21 where alcohol was uh, legal and available, and I had a decent job, and so I could go out to bars and restaurants and have really tasty, really carby food um, anytime I want because I had plenty of disposable income. And so I all of a sudden saw myself at 230 pounds. I had pretty horrible acid reflux. And my lovely wife was pregnant with our daughter, Mazzy, and I realized that something needed to change. Um, I'm an engineer by trade. I work at a, a major phone company that probably everyone here has heard of, but maybe I shouldn't. Uh, it doesn't matter. We're not going to say anything yeah. bad about this. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, no trade secrets, just but just uh, disclosed. Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm an engineer at T-Mobile at their corporate HQ, and um, I'd say that us engineers we're not lazy, we're efficient. And I was trying to figure out what diet I should go on to to lose weight, and I realized I could either count to 20 for carbs or count to 2,000 for calories. That was my thought process in, in 2014, and I'm like, I'm, a, I'm this lazy guy, I don't want to count to 2,000, I'll count to 20 instead. And so uh, it worked really well, I was basically eating unlimited amounts of protein and fat, and I lost about 40 pounds, I was super happy with uh, how things were going, but then I just completely just <laughs> stalled out, completely stalled out. That lasted about six months or so, and then I started seeing this um, gentleman named Ted Naiman. I don't know if anyone in the audience has heard of him. He's my, uh, he's actually my doctor back home. I started seeing him and I was telling him like what I, what I was eating, like how much cream I was putting in my coffee and how much cheese I was putting on everything. And um, he kind of had me back off of the concentrated fats a little bit, focus on protein a little bit more. Um, around this time, I found uh, I found keto gains as well, and um, and that's how I broke that six month stall where I lost another forty pounds, um, leveled out at about one fifty or so. Been doing a lot of weight training, and so I've gained ten pounds with the same pant size. So um, that wasn't body fat that was gained, and uh, here I am five and a half years later. And that's my that's my success story. Excellent. Any uh, tips you have for people that are struggling? I'm a big fan of people really watching their electrolyte intake because that seems to be just a, a common problem. Even when people are like, I've been on the diet for two years and whatever, and it's like, no, seriously, like track your electrolytes. If you track your macros, track that the exact same way. That, that's a tip, and um, um, I, yes? How do you track your electrolytes? I uh, use the app called uh, Chronometer, and then I'll, they're, oh, they're here, no, and, they're, and they're here, yeah, so just like tracking, tracking macros as well. Um, and I find that the, the less food I'm eating and the more body fat I'm oxidizing, the more my electrolyte needs go up. The more physical activity I do, the more I need electrolytes. I um, I climbed Mount St. Helens recently on salt water. I, I literally just drank salt water up the mountain, uh, and that was awesome. Uh, that reminds me, you share a little bit about how your activity levels changed before and after keto. Yeah, so I basically my activity level before keto was I was a home brewer of beer. <laughs> I made a lot of beer. Uh, last time I was here in San Diego was actually for the National Homebrewers Convention. Um, I was an award-winning homebrewer. I had medals and awards and, and everything. And uh, and then 
a couple weeks after I started doing low carb, like I say that my my brain told my butt to just get up and run, and so I started I started running and I um, found some podcasts that way, and that was sort of uh, my community. I didn't have any like friends that were doing the diet or anything, and so I listened to a lot of um, a lot of podcasts and. Uh, Eventually, I started. I started. I started lifting weights, which I think is um, probably a better approach for body composition than than cardio. But I still do like doing cardio for fun, like hiking, and I'm a soccer player as well. Can I ask another question? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> so, um, in terms of getting your electrolytes, I'm assuming you're talking about sodium, magnesium, and potassium. Yep. And I'll, I'll repeat her question because I don't pick up on the okay. audio better. So, uh, she asked it, it, as, in terms of tracking electrolytes, you're tracking magnesium, sodium, potassium. And in which way are you taking them? Are you taking them as, as a pill, as a drink, like a calm, or something like that? And then, in, and then in which way are you taking your supplements then, or, or your electrolytes? So what I like is basically, yeah, sodium, magnesium, potassium into a cup with water, lemon, stevia, and ice. That's just how I do it for like taste preferences. So, so that, what kind of potassium do you use? I use what, what's what called kind of potassium, uh, do you potassium use? I use what's called um, light salt from uh, Morton's. It, you can get it basically any any grocery store. And Mike is the king of efficiency and uh, frugalness. Is that what you would call it, or just you know maximizing, minimizing expenditures for maximum results? Right. Um, yes, that's true. <laughs> he uh, generates all his own electricity at home as well too, and. Just a fun fact. Yeah, I, yeah, that's true too. <laughs> Any other questions for Mike? Do you do you intermittent fast? I do actually, but um, for me, it's mostly out of just convenience um, and as a way of just managing my my total food intake. I I can guarantee that because I've done it, I've gained body fat doing intermittent fasting. Um, from just eating too much. So I, I do intermittent fast, but I um, would not really consider it like a major, major component. Yes? Back to your electrolytes, what form do you take the magnesium? What form of magnesium do you take? Okay, so I have these um, magnesium citrate um, pills, basically. So, And then I also have some magnesium powder because I was trying to um, to clone Tyler's, Tyler's in the back there. I was trying to clone his electrolyte supplement element, and um, so I bought all the different powders. Yeah, and the recipe on the website, so <laughs> you shouldn't have to work real hard. Right, yeah, that's true, yeah. Well, and uh, also then, so what symptoms are you monitoring to know whether you're getting enough electrolytes or not? So if I am uh, about to pass out doing deadlifts, then I know that my <laughs> electrolytes are not balanced if I'm, if I'm hungry, a lot of times that's just a salt thing, not an actual hunger thing. Um, any sort of uh, light headache. Some people say like brain fog. I don't really know what that means, but um, that kind of thing as well. Would you put like a teaspoon of salt in like a 16 ounce glass of water or is that like a way too much? I would start lower. I would start at maybe a quarter teaspoon and kind of work your way up because um, you do too much sodium at once, um, bad things will happen. So. We, we call it disaster pants, yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> With my clients, I find they can tolerate about a half a teaspoon in one dose. Um, more than that, generally, depending on what they need, will cause the problem. I would say most of the time, if someone is constipated, it's probably an electrolyte issue, not a fiber issue. Yeah, I'll add the five yeah. symptoms that I have my clients watch to let them know that especially salt that they don't have enough is constipation, lightheadedness or dizziness, headaches, muscle cramps, uh, fatigue. So if anyone's suffering any of those on a low carb or keto diet, most likely you're not intaking enough sodium specifically, maybe the other electrolytes as well. That's interesting, because I always thought it was the magnesium that, yeah. that caused the leg cramps and I don't know, so that's great. Yeah, it's a common one that people think that it's, it's magnesium and they can't ever get it resolved, but we get enough salt on board for the most part and most of that resolves. So. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, what about iodine? Iodine. So um, actually, I'm gonna I'll, I'll pause this here because um, we're gonna focus on um, success stories and uh, instead of like specific supplement rec recommendations and things like that, just so that we can have time to hear from a lot of people that want to share. So, um, but uh, we'll have this room until later too. So, thank you, Mike, for sharing your story. Thank you, Carol. Excellent. I'll, I'll Abby, would you like to come up and share your I'll success see. story? Thank I love you. your t-shirt too, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> All right, tell us your name and where you're from. Hi, I'm Abby Ross from Miami with a little Palo Alto. California. So where to begin? Um, I'm 68 and I got into macrobiotics. You're familiar with macrobiotics? It's like vegan, but I was adding fish. And I did it for 20 years and enjoyed fabulous success. Wonderful. Then um, life happens and the middle age spread and well, you know, and I read a book, Belly Fat. And I started getting into that and somebody said, you know, it just comes to you. And it came to me. And it was just, I, I want to use the word brainwash, but I, brainwash, not to eat what we eat on this diet. So I started eating this way and I still felt the same vitality and everything because I, I just, I guess I'm blessed with that. I do marathons and I have a lot of energy. So I was thrilled that I kept the same energy, but not to be hungry was the biggest thing ever. I love to eat. In a million years, I never thought I'd forget to eat lunch. I mean, it's just like unheard of. Now, you call it intermittent fasting. My first meal of the day is 12 o'clock. That's just the way it is. I was so brainwashed, you have to have breakfast. Brainwashed. Okay, so my first meal is at 12. I love going out to lunch. I'm retired now with, with friends. And so my, I will arrange it to go out like 11.30 or 12 o'clock, and that's just the way it is, because I'm not hungry. So I guess that's intermittent fasting. Also, and I picked this up at one of these wonderful conferences, I don't do social eating. Isn't that a nice sentence? I don't do social eating. So if we were gonna meet and I hadn't seen you, I'd go for a walk, look. And that's another thing, because I'm not hungry. Okay, so that was absolutely huge. The vitality and not being hungry, and the energy. Now, let's talk about going out. We travel because we're retired and we have a lot of bonus points and we go all over. To be able to go anywhere in the world and eat this way is what a bonus. I don't even have to look at a menu, um, but I do. And I don't have to tell you about avocados and the way we can eat this way. I just absolutely love it. It's, just, it's been phenomenal. And the main things are I'm not hungry. I have the vitality that I want. Um, I had gotten down to be, at the very beginning when I started this. I'm 5'2". I got down to 99 pounds. It was like easy. I'm on Weight Watchers. I'm a lifetime Weight Watcher member. I forgot <laughs> to mention that. And I weigh in every single month of my life. For 49 years I've done it. Only because I don't want to get an extra two pounds because I love to eat. So that was really interesting that I could keep the same vitality and eat. One more thing, the numbers. My cholesterol is high. My cholesterol is high. And that really freaked me out, as much as eating lamb chops. It freaked me out. For a long time, I kept asking all the, the, the people here, blah, 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 blah. Especially when I asked the people not from the United States, because they viewed the situation differently. Let's put it that way. So my, my numbers were climbing, but the ratios were good because of the exercise, I guess. Then I would suggest that they take the Agustin calcium score. I don't know if you're gonna go into that. Okay, because in the marathon community, people were keeling over, and there's a wonderful test, and I'm not gonna go into it now, but it's great, and it's not invasive, which is even greater, and that made me feel a lot more confident once I had taken that calcium heart scan test and had it with, um, with the high cholesterol, because I'm still not crazy about that, and my doctor doesn't either, so we don't discuss that right here. <laughs> Okay, uh, so one more thing. With the, with the number thing, um, well, weighing myself, I have one of those scales with the body percent fat. Oh, so I got down to 99, which was way too low. I loved it. I mean, I loved it. But then I look back at pictures now. It's crazy. Now I'm at 116. I love it. I love going out to eat. I love every single thing about this. I go on all the, I love the group, and I love everything. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if that answers what you want to know. No, that's great. And uh, so I want to ask you, I, I learned last night that your your husband does not follow this way of eating. Right, right. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
And so that can pose special challenges oh, this, for people. This is a great one. Yeah, so. Um, Just make sure he's not. No. Okay. okay, so. Uh, hopefully he doesn't watch this video. No, this is either, great. Either. This is such an important point if well, I can help. It, yeah. So two, two questions for you. One is, you know, how, how is that dynamic between the two of you? And then I'd also like you to contrast how easy it is for you to travel and eat what you eat and how difficult it is for him to travel and try to find something to eat. <laughs> Bingo. Okay, so we were married almost 50 years, 50, which is, that deserves some applause, thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> no. Okay, so um, sometimes in a marriage, one person, sometimes in a marriage, one person sort of leads the way and then the other kind of like, gets into it in some marriages, okay. Well, that happened in this one, and I got into vegan, uh, macrobiotics. 1992, I went to a conference, I was swimming in the pool, and I met Dr. Spock, Benjamin Spock, and he had just gotten into it. It was a Paul Bear at his funeral. He's a fabulous man. And he got me into macrobiotics. And I come home, and I tell my husband, I met Dr. Spock, and it changed his life, and, and cleaned out the cabinets and said, we're gonna be doing it now this way wasn't really a good move, but uh, we started eating this way, and my husband, David, loved it. David is still vegan. I don't know if he knows exactly why, but he's still doing it, and he just turned 70, and he loves doing it, and he went to Cafe Gratitude last night, which is a vegan restaurant, and they had a keto bowl. Oh. Isn't that great? It's the other way around, because normally you would go and have so how do we do it? Um, I found, like with the, when I got him into macrobiotics, I kept nagging and nagging and nagging. And once, honest to God, once I did not give a whatever, that's when he came around. When I, when I, I really didn't care. You eat your way, okay, fine. And then he did. So if, if he ever adapts this way, which I hope he does, but who, you know, if it happens, it happens. Once I let go and did not care. So I go and I can look at the menu and, and David's looking for an impossible burger or something else, um, what's the other, Beyond Burger? Okay, good, but I'm eating a lot of different things. We've worked it out, um, it's not a hot spot. I'm trying to think, it's, it's, it's not a hot spot at all. He comes to the conferences, um, when we start talking, um, I could tell he's uncomfortable and would like to leave, and so I just now I just said, are you gonna do your run now? And he went to do his run because he really doesn't wanna hear about macros or blah, blah, blah. And we just work it out. The bottom, answer to your question is once I did not care, and once I just let go and lead by example. Lead by example. Yeah. That's it. Okay. That's wonderful. Does anybody have any questions for Abby? It's wonderful. Hmm. It's just what, eating out and not being hungry <laughs> and losing weight. When you're traveling around the world and you said you're not going to get to look at a menu, um, do you ever ask? Questions like every single, real, real, every single time I do. Okay. So I, when, when I said let I me, look, uh, and let me just repeat the question because then it'll pick up on the audio better. Um, so she's she's wondering uh, when you're traveling around the world, you ask questions about what's on the menus. Absolutely, and I, I I get so creative. If I see avocado on something, yes, they have avocado. You know, so you 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 get creative with that. So I chance last night. I was a guest of somebody and I had dinner with Carol. Carol sat across from me. How many times did you ask, see me ask, is there sauce on this? Or you just do. Lots of times I don't know, so I use, a, I go strong. I start off right from the beginning. I hate to say this, you know, something I have, whatever condition. Um, I'm allergic, it's great. Does this have whatever? Or, because I have to, it just, I don't want you. And, oh, so you can have a glass of wine on this. Who knew? I mean, I have a glass of wine. So Prosecchi, I don't know why he's, but one of them has a lot of sugar, so for the first week that I was on this, I didn't know that some of it was sparkling and sugar and wine, whatever. But in answer to your question, I totally always ask, always ask questions. I would never get like um, a lamb, meatloaf or anything. I don't know what's, what's in it. And everything is pure. And I only, even at home, I like totally pure, clean stuff. Does that answer? Does that answer the question? Yeah, I, I always ask questions. I always get, I get a lot of like, um, if there's a salad, I'll want romaine and I'll want uh, the cheese. I want olive oil on the sides. Now, I don't get so picky, like what kind of olive oil. Um, I'm so happy if they have olive oil. Yes. You know, a, lot of, a lot of places don't. So it's just so easy to travel. On uh, airplanes, I always bring my own food. I don't even trust any of that stuff. Eggs are not eggs. Eggs are not eggs. No, even like uh, pan oh, or some of the pancake places. The batter, that's not eggs. I mean, 
first of all, I don't even want eggs that are come in a box, that kind of thing. But even if you had to be in that situation, there are a lot of, a lot of other things. Cream is not cream, you know, all that stuff. I love this way of eating. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. You know? Thank you so much for sharing your story, Abby. Thank you so much for being here. Who would like to share their story next? Yes, the lady in the gray, gray white sweater. Yes, 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 white sweater. Yes, yes, you. <laughs> Come on down. Give it up for uh, Coco. Sephora. That is Coco. Coco. Coming next to the stage, we've got Coco. Welcome. Hi. Good, how are you? Um, nervous, but I'll tell, yeah, tell us your name and where you're from. Okay, my name is Socorro Alanese. I go by little closer. I go by Coco, and I'm actually just down the street in Bonita, so I'm local. And I have you beat. I am a former Weight Watchers coach. <laughs> <laughs> and I still weigh in as a lifetime member. <laughs> and that's my story. I'm a former Weight Watchers coach. Doing the program, it changed. The year that I became a coach, the program totally changed. And the nine pounds that I was so proud that I had lost in a period of 12 months, I gained it all back plus when the new program came in, which we call Freestyle. My hashtag is Freestyle Sucks. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I noticed that um, what this uh, video recording is not uh, does not reflect the uh, opinions that are expressed here on this uh, interview. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, I'll, I'll behave. Um, but what I did notice was that I went to go do my annual, and um, my blood sugar had skyrocketed, mm -hmm. and they wanted to put me on metformin. My cholesterol had skyrocketed, and I was following the plan. I'm a meticulous tracker. I was following the plan, and of course I had gained all my weight back. So I had seen a friend post months before that she had lost weight and her blood levels had regulated and become normal doing keto. And so I sent her a message and she bombarded my messenger <laughs> Facebook with all of these doctors because I said I only want reputable doctors, MDs because I'm kind of anal that way. That's what I want. I want to see doctors that use this style of eating. It took six weeks to read, listen, check out books. My husband thought I was nuts. Mm -hmm. And within three months, I had lost 21 pounds. My blood sugar had regulated. My cholesterol was still a little elevated, but I ran into Dave Feldman and oh, oh my word, that just changed my world. Um, since then, I am just devoted to this lifestyle. My husband, like Abby's, kind of just, I'm not doing this. Don't talk to me about this. This is not me. I'm like, okay. Well, since the beginning of the year, my husband has lost 35 pounds. We go down golfing to Mexico, and he pulls everything out of the tacos. He unwraps his enchiladas and eats the cheese. <laughs> He takes off the breading off his chili rellenos and eats the chili and eats the cheese, and he's still not doing keto, though. <laughs> he's in denial. But it's amazing. My grandchildren are now keto because we found gluten to really be impacting their joints and their health. So they are now keto, and that's four of them, including a two-year-old. The 10-year-old reads all the ingredients and says, oh, no, 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 we can't have that because it has too much sugar. We have to find the spaghetti sauce. No, no, never mind, just make your own spaghetti sauce. <laughs> All of these have too much sugar. They love going to Costco, but they always ask the sample lady, well, um, does it have sugar? Does it have gluten? These are 10, eight, six year old kids. And the interesting story, I digress, but my daughter was shopping with all of them at Costco and the little one, he's two, he was sitting in the cart and this man who she kept running across the aisle, he just stopped and said, how is your child able to sit for all this time? And she goes, oh, you know, they're just well behaved. And the 10 year old responded, no mom, we don't have sugar crashes. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that insightful for a 10 year old? I thought so. Wow. So anyway, just to say, I led a lot of people down the road, the keto road. And I am currently coaching one, two, three, four, five 
Weight Watchers coaches. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thank you, Coco, for sharing. That's wonderful. Any questions? Any other questions for Coco? Thank you so much. Congratulations on Thank your success. You. Who's going to come up next to share their story? Yes. Hello, welcome. Uh, Greg. I'm Greg, and I'm here with my wife Susan from New Hope, Pennsylvania. Okay. So and far, the farthest away that's in the group, maybe? Yeah, we were torn between going to Keto Fest, which was a three-hour drive or coming here, and... Boy, oh, don't tell them that no. you, we went out. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, so 23, almost 24 years ago, my father... Ah, here I go again. Shucks. Sorry. I'm, I'm choked up, and I didn't even get it out. Um, almost 24 years ago, my father died from type 2 diabetes complications, and it was ugly. My mother nagged me for years. Uh, something apparently women are good at. Anyway, um, <coughs> uh, anyway, I finally went to the doctors and the doctor says, so why are you here? And I told him, you know, my mother's nagging me, blah, blah. And he looked at me and says, you don't have diabetes. So like two days later, I get this frantic call from him on my cell phone and he said, um, you need to go to the pharmacy immediately. You're fasting blood sugar, <laughs> sorry, it's over 400. I thought I worked this out when I, when I was tell, telling yeah. you the story. Anyway, um, and uh, so, you know, given what I saw, it's like, this is a freaking death sentence. Anyway, fast forward, and uh, I came across this book by Dr. Bernstein, who's on the East Coast, and I looked at this book, and it was like, I threw it on the shelf. I was like, this guy's nuts. And uh, I'm a scientific skeptic, or at least I thought I was, and uh, so Gary Topps comes out with his article and they shredded him. I mean, this guy's an idiot, da, 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 da. And some of these people I really respected and I came across the first time in my life and I think it's relevant to why we're having such a hard time getting this movement off the ground is that cognitive dissonance. So I had two things in my mind that were opposite. The one is, you know, low fat, carbs, it, it, Calories in, calories out, yada yada. And then there's the history of dieting and, the, and, and what Gary Tobbs and Nina Teicholz and other people have done. And um, so I, I have, I've become comfortable with this dissidence. So I can hold now multiple ideas in my head that are opposite and be with the discomfort. Sort of like when I fast and I get started and I'm like uncomfortable, but I can look down the road and just be with it. So anyway, uh, about uh, 58 weeks ago, because I log everything, I'm an engineer, I started doing 100% keto, uh, where I had dabbled with low-carb-ish stuff. And um, I... Uh, I'm down now 60 pounds from my start, and um, <laughs> darn, uh, I don't mind getting emotional, I just, I, it stops me from talking, that, that's the problem. So, um, so I'm down 60 pounds, I'm, I'm at my quote fighting weight, and the last things I'm working on are to, um, through autophagy, to remove the loose skin around my stomach, my doctor says, who's big in this community? Dr. Sotokov, I just switched to him. Uh, says it's, a, it's a, a vanity thing. I disagree. Number two, I have a tinnitus ringing in the ears and Dr. Bosworth says you can get rid of it through ketosis, lowering inflammation, and autophagy, getting rid of the calcification. Um, actually, there were three things. Oh, that's good, too. Two's good. Anyway, um, so I'm good to go. And I talk too much. Oh, Greg, that was great. Thank you so much. And, um, just, I'm so sorry for your loss. And thank you for being so vulnerable with us and sharing something that's obviously extremely important and impactful. And I shared earlier with everyone before everyone was here, but um, we never know who we're going to impact with our story. And um, So I'm here as an advocate. Uh, I am an engineer. Totally, and I talked to absolutely everyone about this. 
And my theory is something like the hundredth monkey. That is, we all got to get out there in the trenches and do what we do, however we do it. There's a lot of people who are out there, like the people that are on the front lines. They literally are, picture World War I, they're in the trenches and the Germans are gassing them and so on and so forth. And it's like, I am in awe by people who have lost hundreds of pounds by the doctors who, <laughs> darn, are uh, risking their careers, you know, that, that, that yeah. it's like astonishing. It's like, you know, I don't know that I would do that. You know, I don't know that I would put it on the line like that, but luckily I don't. But uh, I predict within five years, we are gonna see a flip such that uh, people are gonna deny and ignore that, you know, you used to live a very different lifestyle. You know, I, I think that's what's gonna happen. And my prediction, just like uh, gay, someday I'd like to see gay pride parades go away. Why? Because we don't need them. It's just people pride. And similarly, we won't need these kind of conferences because it'll become part of our environment and it'll become a quaint thing. Can I ask a question? Um, I had the joy of meeting you a, a little while ago in, in Your Wonderful Life. Can you tell about, um, in relationship, how that plays out? Like, I, like yeah. So I'll just, I'll just repeat so it gets on the audio better. Um, can you share how your yeah. keto lifestyle impacts your relationship with your wife? So my wife was, was there from ground zero when I found out and she saw you know my father go through that thing. And um, so uh, it's been going on for years and I've done lots of dumb things. You know, like I remember this cereal I used to eat, Kashi, right? It was like you cook mm -hmm. this stuff. And uh, let's just say there was a lot of biological creations around it um, <laughs> and uh, anyway you know um, it took me years to get behind it and you know when I started doing fasting for example she thought I was suffering and she couldn't understand why why after day three I'm like full of energy and uh, so anyway she cooks a lot most of the cooking in the house and she's a fantastic cook when I come off fast it's like uh, I come home to this incredible thing. My, my favorite thing right now is, uh, what are those pork rinds? They're pork rinds. There's some high-end pork rinds. Oh, Epic brand? Yes. Yes. Oh. And, and my favorite thing is a bag of those with liver pate that she makes. It's like, it is like, it's almost like a sexual experience. It's that, it's that good. And my sex life is pretty good too. Which, which I, I, I'm, that's not what? No, we, no, so, so no, we, no, we talk about all kinds of stuff. And one of the things that has improved dramatically is our sex lives. And, and I'm, I mean, it, I, you know, it's kind of, really, I guess this is the only environment you can really talk about it, you know? Like, I am way more, uh, Whatever, uh, she's satisfied, let's just say that, and I'm satisfied. Um, but the, the thing is, is that she's an incredible support. We are on the same page. She got certified as a keto coach. Uh, I, just, I just blab all the time. And um, we're teaching a night school class for the second time in September. And I, you know, I'm gonna come at it differently. I'm gonna, the, the thing I wanna start off with and I think she'd get behind this, is that, um, I'm gonna say, what would I do if I got cancer, right? Because that's not a question people answer. And it, the answer is really easy. I would immediately follow the standard care. I would get surgery. I would do chemo. I would do radiation. However, I also would have doctors and hospitals sign a contract that you will not feed me your crap diet or you will be sued, right? In other words, they're not gonna sign that. But the point is, <laughs> is that um, our hospitals are designed to keep us sick. And it's, it's through forcing change that way. I would bet my life on it. I'm just saying. Um, yes? In the you mentioned the weight loss, but was it diabetes reverse? Oh yeah. So the question, question is then, uh, you lost, lost weight, but did you reverse your diabetes? Yeah, so that happened uh, first. So the um, so in the last go around, in the last 58 weeks, I lost 30 pounds. 
And, um, you know, I know we all, we shouldn't look at weight as a thing, but I'm an engineer and I measure everything. So I look at trends over weeks, you know, and uh, so, so you definitely saw the numbers reverse first. Yes? Uh, thank you for sharing your story, it's very, very powerful. You mentioned uh, in passing about um, fasting and like the loose skin and, and autophagy. Have you seen results from that? So, uh, question is, um, have you seen results from uh, reduction in loose skin from autophagy and fasting? Um, I would say, given that I have an almost Speedo-like bathing suit, and my wife often comments that I look good, that the answer is yes. Uh, and also, because I measure everything, I'm doing the Dr. Ben workout, that's part of the reason why I'm here. Um, and I've done all my skin measurements, and definitely the waist has gotten smaller. And so I would guess, given my, um, whatever the, given my situation, it's probably gonna take another year to a year and a half to, to achieve the final, final goal. How long do you fast and how often? So what's your, what's your fasting protocol? All right, so right now, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch it up when I come back, but what I do is I fast, month, uh, I eat Sunday night and then I eat Wednesday night, and then I eat, Thursday night, Friday night, and then I go off the rails on the weekend. And what the data show is that I need to change that up a little bit. That is, I think I'm going to do one meal a day, seven days a week with carnivore, uh, and just see how it goes. The numbers don't lie. I have a continuous glucose monitor on, which I absolutely love, and it gives you a calculation of A1C every day and your average blood sugar, and so therefore, um, it's, it's a good feedback. So when you say you go off the rails on the weekend, you mean you're still eating keto, just? Yeah, so, so I'm still eating keto. I tend to keep my carbs down below 20, but my protein will often go through the roof, and then I, I, see, I see the blips in my blood sugar. So you've noticed that you tend to be a little more sensitive to protein then? Yes, okay. that, that appears to be the case. What's your, um, the amount of protein on the weekends that you're eating compared to the week? Well, during the week, um, I'm somewhere around 100, 110 grams a day. In the weekend, I can go 140 or more, you know, depending. Um, and so, uh, it's, it's just interesting. Yes, all right. Yeah, any other questions for Greg? Yes. Can you ask Tom about protein, how do you think going part of She's asking about how going carnivore. Yeah, that's 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 a good that's a good point. So just just heavy duty on the fat. So I I my favorite these days is uh, pork belly, mm. and pork belly's definitely balanced that way. And so the the idea is I come home and I'm just you know I I have to push the plate away usually. I just can't I just can't eat much of it. So uh, I'm just going to keep more of an eye on the protein. Uh, but and, and just uh, amp up on the fat, and so, which is another thing. I just had a DEXA scan. That's why I was late for this. And what's interesting, I did it last year <coughs> on the East Coast, and, and my body fat, according to them, has come down by almost three percent, which yes. is interesting. So I'm like eighteen point seven right now. Not bad. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, thank you, Greg, so much for sharing your story. Wow. Very inspiring. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, is this Greg's wife that wants to share next? Yes. Susan, Susan come on, Susan. Good. 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 Uh, my name is Carol Freeman, Susan, and I'm gonna. I'll call uh, Tyler. I'll put you on deck. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Just a warning. Yes. Yes. Uh, put the weights on the bat and start start warming up. <laughs> Susan, welcome. Thank, Please, you, uh, thank you so much. Tell us um, where you're from. We're from uh, New Hope, Pennsylvania, a little town between Philadelphia and New York City. And uh, this is our first time here. And um, I have a ketogenic um, coaching credential that I use primarily credentialing to uh, have form around learning. And uh, I love to learn. I don't coach uh, other than as a volunteer. And I use it to support our advocate 
advocacy efforts. I have a regular job selling advertising for an association, the head of which used to be the head of the American Diabetes Association. And so I kind of looking at my everyday life, how can I affect each and every person that uh, we come in contact with, including the potential of the association world. And I've gone into the HR uh, person at the American Diabetes, I'm sorry, American Society of Association Executives to kind of get a sense of, you know, could a program be brought in there like a Verda or uh, something like that. And boy, you do get a lot of pushback. Every time I open my mouth and I'm just trying to be more responsible for speaking relevantly and accurately and not just, you know, off, off the cuff. Um, so I've been married to Greg for, uh, it will be 24 years and uh, now, I used to be 20 pounds overweight. I was reading my aunt's Weight Watchers book at eight years old. I have two sisters close in age to me, and they were always lean, and looking back, they have always ate more protein and fat than me. They'd have a bacon egg and a pancake. I'd have a piece of bacon and a stack of pancakes, like an insatiable, very different personality, an emotional eater did all the diets, and so when Greg and I got together, because Greg was overweight as a child, we had an interest in how do you deal with this, and we did the, the low um, fat, um, high carb for a while, and then uh, did Atkins, um, felt very sick on that, too much protein, and uh, so about two decades we've been doing low carb, but started keto, uh, for me, it was uh, one, about one year ago. And I did it more out of curiosity um, to help him as a, as a, a wife. And um, I, I got two incredible, unexpected results. And I don't really talk about it, uh, which is why I wanna be up here, but I have two conditions that are virtually gone. One is sinusitis. I was squirting a steroid up my nose for about uh, 15 years, back when it wasn't available over the counter. I would be paranoid to not have that with me at all times. And it, my nose would close. I didn't like that feeling of not breathing at night. And I have not used a steroid for a year. And, and I can breathe through my nose. Sometimes I get a little stuffy, but I'll use that Arm & Hammer, you know, salt, saline in the shower, but not what I've had. And I don't know how to explain that to anyone. That you all understand. Inflammation, Lauren. The second one is a, actually a more serious condition I have called occipital neuralgia. And I might, I might cry a little because, um, I don't know if it's women, but we don't seem to complain. We kind of tolerate our pain, you know? And uh, so I had a little um, whiplash from a car accident. I have mild arthritis in my neck. The way occipital neuralgia pre presents itself, based on my neurologist, is as if you're having an aneurysm. There's something happens that you get pain on one side of the head. It took me a while to get my brain and my neck MRI so they could see it was not a uh, aneurysm. And it's also our modern day, the way we hold our neck, you know, with the computer. So my neurologist said, he sees four cases of this a day. It's becoming more common. And when you stress, it's even worse. So um, I suffered on and off with debilitating pain from my neck caused the worst when I got a stress stress situations in my life. So anyway, over a year ago, went to the neurologist and he said, this is lifestyle related. He did, I wasn't doing keto, I didn't even know really what it was and if it could even help me. No issues, none, other than mild tension, but not the pain. And so the inflammation lowering is astounding that and more to come on that. I don't, I don't know what to do with that other than to share it and with the hopes that if this can lower my inflammation, uh, who else can this help? How can we help people who are on opioids, for example? 
I understood why people did opioids with the kind of pain I got from my neck. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I am just feeling pretty good and enjoying the eating and um, doing more strength training because I do have osteopenia. I seriously want to build my lean body mass. I think I'm gonna be around for a while based on my other health markers. And I, my grandmother died at 100. You know, I, I wanna do what I can to be strong and have a clear mind and to help people. Uh, were children involved? Yeah, four, did four, you, do you have children? Four, four, four children together. So how, was, how do you handle food with children? Well, the youngest uh, uh, graduated out of college and we're really glad to be empty nesters. <laughs> and uh, she's actually a vegan. And, uh, and she's not, she's 23 and just eats even bad as a vegan. And you know, like just- And they the, come to your house for like, Meals or how does that play uh, out? On and off, we're mostly they tell us to shut up. You know, <laughs> we are advocates and we talk a lot about it. Um, but you see some tweaking with them. Uh, it was my son who told me first about bulletproof coffee mm -hmm. years before, and I thought it was the grossest thing. And now today, I'm like, do you have two pats of butter? You know, to, and um, um, so, and our daughter lives in New Zealand and was home visiting. Uh, and um, I was cooking bone marrow in the oven and she woke up from sleeping. <laughs> she's a vegan and she's like, what does that smell? <laughs> <laughs> so we have hope that um, because, you know, we think she's definitely takes more after dad and genetically is gonna face some problems. She already has. She's got a lot of weight here. Thank you. Right. Any other questions for Susan? Yeah, Coco. I want to know your workout routine. You know, uh -huh. guns are amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Question about your workout. What's your routine? Thank you. Thank you first so much. And, wow. and this is all new to me. I did not have these arms. And I do do Dr. Ben's slow maximum resistance training. And I have to thank Greg for getting me up in the morning twice a week and lifting very safely, very heavy weights getting my heart rate up uh, slowly and uh, mindfully and full body and um, I think part of this is genes too because I just just not me you know I'm trying to step into this and and um, uh, but, but thank you oh my, oh my just guns. don't go across the border because you won't be able to uh, back those guns <laughs> <laughs> thank you all right, thank you, Susan, so much for sharing your story. And I love that you point out how much pain relief this is, because that's another thing you might hear from other people, too, is how powerful this is for pain relief. Thank so you. Thank you, thank you so much for being here. All right, I'm going to ask uh, Tyler Cartwright to come up and share his story. I'm going to check the time here. OK, we're about an hour in. That's good. So it's about um, 10.30 right now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. perfect. So. so sure, we'll go with that. Welcome, Tyler Cartwright, please. Uh, oh, say your name, I already did that. And where are you from? I live outside of Nashville, Tennessee. Just mm -hmm. where I'm from, sorry. My name is Tyler Cartwright, you already did that. I did, so. yes, yes. Uh, do I need to ask you questions the whole time to yes, tell your story? that's how this no, works. No, because yeah. you're gonna talk for Does this actually work? work? Yeah. I, I can't, you just there's gotta hold no, it, like. You gotta hold it closer to your mouth. Like in, in yes. Okay. Well, okay, not that far. Okay. There, that's perfect. So, okay. Tyler, please share your sure. your story. Start from the beginning. You were born where? No, I'm just I was kidding. born in a small town called Princeton, Kentucky. Um, so about 13 years ago, I weighed a quarter of a ton. Um, I've dropped about 300 pounds, and I've maintained for about the last three and a half years or four years at about 205. Do uh, right now, uh, let's just call this bulking season, and we'll say it's about 225, and we'll move on. But. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. You're done. No, I'm just That's amazing. That's, so, um, yeah, the, the conference season always takes its toll. And so uh, once the conference season's over, it's back to the gym and back to the chicken breast. And uh, we get back in the gym a little more earnestly. So, um, so yeah, uh, I guess that's it. No. We actually uh, started a company called Keto Gains a few years ago trying to help people who were looking to try and there was a lot of information that was out there around um, endurance training or just kind of 
couch surfing lifestyles, for lack of a, a you know a better way to, to describe it, of people. But there were also a lot of people who were like, hey, I like to lift weights too, but like there's no information on how to do this in a way that makes any sense relative to everything we know about you know, muscle hypertrophy and strength gains and those sorts of things. And we just, where's the information? And so Luis and I sort of started telling everybody, this is kind of how you do it if you want to do this. And the communities across all social media, about a quarter of a million people now. And we, we did the math and <laughs> I was actually talking with one of the doctors outside and, and it's interesting. Uh, we were tracking about 850 or so of our clients over the last three and a half years that we've worked with. And they're almost 90,000 pounds down at this point. Um, across the 2,700 or so folks that we've worked with over the last four years, using that backwards math because I was a telecom engineer and I can do basic math as well. Um, yeah, we're, we're somewhere just over a quarter of a million pounds lost. Um, we would be just over uh, about 380,000 inches gone. And across our whole community, based on some data and polling that we did, it would be about 1.6 million pounds that people have lost uh, just in the last four years. Wow. wow. Amazing. Yeah. And by the way, never do upper body and then hold a microphone after like 45 <laughs> minutes after you leave the gym. Because I'm up here like, I think You're people are like, I'm too you low need to, to hold it for you. I, I need a spotter right now. <laughs> <laughs> like I just need somebody to stand here. So yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and, and you and uh, Luis are going to be doing a breakout session on. We'll be back here, I think, on Friday. We're talking about okay. sustained change and some of the habits that we actually see between people who make changes and kind of recidivistically return back to where they were versus those who seem to make it a lifestyle of change, right? And there are some pretty marked differences. So. Wonderful. Um, and you guys are out there busting the myths about, um, you know, a couple of things for sure is that you don't need massive amounts of carbs to grow muscle. You don't. Um, and you also don't need to fear protein. You really don't. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's funny people are like, oh, those guys are high protein. I'm like, no, I'm high exercise. There's a difference, <laughs> right? Um, you know, recommendations, I was I was talking to somebody who said, you guys are just high protein, and I said, like, you know, the funny thing is, you know, if you do the math on me from Finney and Bullock's work, and then you look at our recommendations, I'm recommending six grams more protein per day. The delta is not as big as people like to make it out to be. I think there's just a perception, because I'm a big guy, and Luis looks like he can bench press a Buick, <laughs> that uh, somehow, we're eating 700 grams of protein a day, and as much as I'd like to try, um, like 100% sure I would just be in a meat coma laying in the parking lot somewhere, and they'd call the ambulance. So, uh, so yeah. Um, started a company selling packeted electrolytes, so I've joked that I'm like salty claws at all these conferences. If you find me, you can have a, a non-alcoholic margarita in three seconds. <laughs> Yeah, plug for Element. Uh, yeah, we are now officially uh, the hydration drink of the United States of America's weightlifting team. They uh, have actually recognized that what we've been saying for 10 to 12 years now, you don't need carbs to be strong. You may need some carb to recover, but you don't need carbs to be strong. Like those two things are just completely antithetical to one another, and we've known that for 75 years in the research. But never get between a bro and his science, so. <laughs> Yeah, question. So I missed your, the very first part when you said you're with Keto. Uh, Luis and I actually started a company called Keto Gains. It's actually on my mug, which was totally not intentionally plugged. I just realized that it's facing everybody. I didn't oh, mean for okay. that to be a thing. It's not on the, the uh, camera. Uh, no, I'm talking about those folks out there. I just happened to set it there because, so, again, I'm shaky and I didn't want to sit here and try to hold two things. So are you Keto or are you carnivore? I am keto, although I joke that I'm like 94% carnivore most of the time because I'm funny about plant foods. Over the years, I've realized that it's not so much that I don't like plants or plant-based foods. There's just a lot of plant-based foods that don't like me. Um, things that cause me to walk around feeling like the steak puff marshmallow man after I eat them for a while. So I tend to be very specific. I eat a lot of berries as like a recovery, either pre or post. So I'll have like some blueberries or some strawberries or something on those lines. Um, a lot of spinach salads when I want something bulking. Plus you also get some iron and some iodine and some other fun stuff in that. And uh, honestly, occasionally I'll sneak in green beans, but legumes and I have kind of a love-hate thing in general. 
um, onions, peppers, that sort of thing. But most of the time, it's turf and turf. Um, <laughs> that's that's kind of where that's the range in which I live. Uh, I'm in the middle of arguing with my HOA over whether my uh, stick burning smoker that I want is a mobile chimney or whether it's actually a stick burning smoker because they'll allow one but not the other. So I tend to be whatever goes in the smoker and can stay there for 12 hours is kind of what I eat. So, so would not call me carnivore, but I'm carnivore adjacent. So as we talk about protein, sorry, um, how many grams of protein per kilogram of body weight do you recommend? You're gonna make me do math yeah, backwards what's here. So. Um, or so gen generally speaking, I would say that it really depends. Um, the research says that about 0.7 grams per pound of lean body mass is kind of the hard stop if you want to avoid lean mass losses. But that delta moves because as we get older, we become less sensitive to leucine, which is one of the amino acids in protein. So as we get older, in order to stave off sarcopenia and muscle loss and osteopenia, we actually do need to eat more protein. I said this because keto is to some degree lean mass sparing. It is not in any way magically anabolic. It does tend to waste less protein in, in bereft periods of time when you're not eating large amounts of protein. Um, there is kind of a natural advantage as we age to thinking about moving into a lower carb modality, even if you don't want to go full scale keto because you can get away with probably 15 or 20 grams a day less protein than you would if you were eating more of a standard American or a Western diet. So for the, kind of the average rank and file person, somewhere between like 0.68 and 0.8 pounds per, or grams per pound of lean body mass is gonna be ideal. And I like anchoring it to lean body mass because if we use total body mass, then when I was 505 pounds, I would have been eating like nine pounds of meat a day, kind of like that's just nuts, right? Um, and if somebody was coming in, like my partner Louise was actually anorexic in college and was he told me 64 kilos at his at his lowest. Um, and he's a guy who's five foot nine, so I mean he's not a completely diminutive guy. Um, you know, on those sides of the situation, you would actually be under eating protein relative to your actual physiologic needs. So, you know, lean mass is really the metabolically active part of us. It's organ tissue, bone tissue, it's muscle tissue, it's all of that. That doesn't do anything uh, in terms of it's like 0.1 calorie per hour per pound of fat or something insanely minuscule. So we don't need to really consider it with respect to, to how much protein we should be eating in any given day. How does fasting fit in to what you're doing? How does fasting fit in? I tend towards the Berta model. Um, I, I will recognize that if I was actually chasing maximal strength performance and that sort of thing, that the answer would be three to four times a day I would need to eat full stop. Um, I tend to eat one or two times a day predominantly because I'm just freaking busy. We run about 800 clients at any point in time and they all deserve what we can do, right? And you know, it's any time you do your job as a pastor for seven years and it's kind of whatever you put your hand to, do it to the best of your abilities, right? And so. Um, yeah, I mean, there'll be days when I look up and I'm like, oh, it's nine o'clock at night and I haven't had anything to eat. I probably should put food in me. Um, so I've kind of anchored it to where I'll have something protein-based, either liquid or, or meals before I train. And then I'll usually have an actual substantive meal you know, later in the day. But So it's not that I'm really intentional and I'm like at the app on my phone or watching a clock or anything, but I just gravitate towards like maybe a 16-8 or like a 14-10 kind of a range. I was sitting here going, God, I hope I don't get those numbers wrong. <laughs> you have 26 hour days where you live? Um, what do you want back there, Berta? So uh, you mentioned when you were a quarter of a ton, so five, 500 pounds. 505 at my heaviest, and I had to be measured on a grain scale and the, or a loading scale in the back of our doctor's office. And after I got measured, the nurse looked at me, started crying, and hugged me. And, so that, you might have actually just answered my question because what I was going to ask was there was there a specific moment where you were like I might literally be killing myself and then B did that result in a ketogenic diet or doing like a top other diet and then eventually took it. So you know it's funny like I tell the story and I've talked about the nurse hugging me and I'd love to find her but I have no idea I didn't get a name at the time and 
good news, I haven't seen that doctor in 14 years because uh, I'm, I'm not normally sick and got another doctor that actually agrees with what I do that uh, takes good care of any medications that I need. And, um, you know, it's funny, she, she, she reached over and like started crying and hugged me. And I was sitting there thinking, lady, <laughs> It's not like I didn't know I was fat when I walked in here. Like, um, it's like when, oh, sh like, but, like, I didn't have, like, a spontaneous moment where it's like, all this time I thought I was just, like, when you're in the pool and your, your swimsuit kind of puckers around. Like, that's not what happened, right? Like, I knew I was morbidly obese. You know, but I tell people a lot of times, like, you don't get to a quarter of a ton because you have a healthy relationship with food, right? Like, you're, you're eating your emotions, you're eating you're eating a lot of things and then it becomes uh, was a fat bastard from the Austin Powers movies as I eat because I'm, uh, I'm unhappy and I'm unhappy because I eat and that's the worst Scottish impression <laughs> over here um, it became that right like I was eating because I was unhappy because things you get into the posters of life and everything is going wrong and I've dealt with depression and social anxiety my whole life um, and there's always comfort in two extra large all meat pizzas. Like Ben and Jerry never let me down once. Mm -hmm. And like then you get to a point where you have to eat. Because I would literally fall asleep driving to work to the point where my, do my boss basically said, you can just stay at home because you're not safe to drive. And I would sleep 18 to 20 hours a day and had to figure out ways to shoehorn nine or 10 hours worth of work every day into three or four hours. So I became hyper-efficient as an engineer and a spreadsheet ninja. Um, so I guess that's a plus. But, uh, you know, it wasn't like everybody wants like that biggest loser moment where like, I, there's a really crass version of this that I tell sometimes when I've had a glass of vodka, but um, I won't do that version. But like the, um, <laughs> but like, the, you know, like everybody wants to find out like, you know, Oh, I've been hiding this horrible secret or this this thing that I don't want the rest of the world to know. And now that I'm I'm out, I'm sharing it, and I'm everything. Like now, I can deal with all of this stuff. And it's never that. Like nobody got a quarter of a ton because they had one thing wrong. It was just a cascade of things that were defective and broken. And then when you get that weight, I mean, my wife was desperately wanting a child. We physically didn't fit together. Sorry for being direct, but after we talked about sex life, I feel like I can, I can jump that shark a little bit and come back. Um, you know, those are things and those are the moments that like, they just, you realize what a failure you are. And so I'll try and boil this down to the three minute version because it's a long story. But, um, so my mother wrote me a letter and like, yeah, this is the, uh, this is the Tyler Cries portion. Um, my mother's five foot two and about 135 pounds soaking wet. And I once called her a magic B word when I was 17 years old and she grabbed me. Now you need to understand I was an 1800 pound three lift guy at 17 years old. And I was full of muscle piss and vinegar and I called her a word that you should never call a woman or a mother. And I'm pretty sure people get uncomfortable even when you call a female dog this. Um, and she snatched me by the ear, all six foot, 230 pounds of 6% body fat me, and drugged me around the room, slapping me in the face and yelling, wait, I don't need to wait till your father gets home. We're gonna take care of this right now. And all I could say was, yes ma'am, yes ma'am, yes ma'am, over and over and over. That's the kind of personality that we're talking about in my mother. She is an old school country girl from Kentucky. She wrote me a letter that said, Tyler, uh, moms aren't supposed to bury their sons. And it was pretty emotionally uh, gut-wrenching, but I, I, I put on my 17-year-old hat and decided I was just gonna be angry at her and screw her and the world and everybody else. And so uh, um, not long after that, I was actually at, we own some land in Kentucky and hunt pretty regularly. and. Uh, was up there and I got up at three o'clock to get ready to go out into the woods for deer season's opening day and my dad wasn't in the bed because we tend to share a king size and we do the man thing where you face opposite directions so it's not weird. Um, and uh, he wasn't in the bed. And so I got up and saw him sitting. He's a heart attack survivor with a fake knee and so you assume bad things unfortunately when you wake up and somebody's not there. So I'm checking the other side of the bed and I get up and I go into the living room and he's sitting there and he's crying. Now to tell the story, I once buried a treble hook. If any of you have ever fished, it's the little hook with three hooks on it. 
um, into his back when I was six years old. And I mean down to the shank. And we went to a marina where they sterilized a box knife with kerosene, which I'm not even sure is a thing, but like it seemed like a thing because we had watched Rambo. And had them to cut the flesh off around the barbs and yank this thing out with a big chunk of his back. And he did not make a noise. Mede played football at the University of Kentucky and watched several of his teammates die because of stupid drills done in ridiculous conditions that would be completely illegal now. This is the kind of guy I'm talking about. Mede was in tears. And he said, I want you to know something. He said, I, I stayed up all night last night listening to my son's last breath every 90 seconds. He said, you, you're going to die. And he said, and I'm never going to bring it up again, but I owe it to you to say this. He said, you, you only breathe every 90 seconds when you sleep, and when you do breathe, you gasp for air like it is uh, like a drowning man fighting to stay above the water. He said, I have no idea how you're not dead yet, but you're making your way there. Um, came back, I had bought an F-150, the seat didn't work, uh, the seatbelt didn't work, I was too big. Um, but I bought the F-150 because its seat went far enough back that I could clear the steering wheel without it being a huge issue. And uh, so I went to the dealership to get seat belt extenders and the lady who was at the, count at the parts counter, is a young girl, was like a size negative four. I, I don't know if that's an actual size, but I think that her waist was actually inverted. Um, <laughs> And God bless her, there's a the thing in, in engineering or in life called Hanlon's Razor. This is never ascribed to malice, that which was adequately explained by incompetence. I had to tell her three times what the thing was. Now, I want you to understand there was an 85-year-old man in the room who was about as big around as my left arm. There was a young, uh, a young Indian lady, and then there was me at 500 pounds. And so she proceeds to come back into a parts counter smaller than this room, and instead of saying, sir, your parts are ready, she gets over the PA system and announces, by the way, not only to the parts counter, but to the entire property, um, the gentleman with the seat belt extenders, uh, your parts are ready. Um, come to the parts counter and pick them up. While looking at me, and I just wanted to look at her and say, are there any other bearded fat guys here that would need this? Like, is this a thing? And so took them and I left and I did what I always do. I went to my favorite Mexican restaurant called the Lazy Donkey. It doesn't exist anymore, sadly. And you know you eat someplace too often when the restaurant has a table for you. And I mean, it's your table. And it's also the only table you fit at in the entire restaurant, which is why it's your table. I got there and they actually moved a family. Like they literally just made them get up and move like I was the, like the fattest mafia don that ever existed. And so I sat down, and, and they didn't even take my order because they knew what I got. It was two chicken chimichangas, uh, you know, double rice, large bowl of cheese dip, and all the chips you can bring, and bring me two Cokes because you can't keep up with me. And uh, they did, and right as the food came out, um, I remember leaning back to get out of the way because they kept screaming hot plate like they do at every Mexican restaurant. And um, so, yeah, I... Uh, Felt the chair crack. I uh, then went uh, kind of black when I hit the floor, and when I woke up, uh, maybe two or three seconds later, I was coated from uh, mid nipple to mid knee in cheese dip and rice. Um, and so I got up and threw twenty dollars on the counter and literally ran to the truck. Um, I drove out to a spillway dam, uh, which is not far from my house, and there's a little eddy where like the water is still and people have little picnics and stuff and the kids can swim out in the water and play. And I just had a moment, like, you know, that like Tyler's gonna break down and cry, um, everything is weepy. And I just realized like I was failing as a husband and as a son and as a, a, an employee and as a human being and as a pastor and as all of these other things. And Meanwhile, halfway there, I had realized that my pants were too tight. By the way, my size 64 elastic-waisted pants were too tight, and I, uh, I had to unbutton them because, uh, you know, you swell throughout the day when you're that large. And um, so I'm sitting there, and I have this moment of realization that I am bawling to the point that my eyes are swollen, my face is red, the window is cracked because it was pretty warm, and um, I have my pants unbuttoned with 
what looks like dried cheese, if you know what just happened to me, all over my lap. And I'm watching children in bathing suits swimming in the water across the way and crying like baby Huey. Like, if these people call the police, I'm going to federal prison. Like, there is no way I'm ever going to be able to explain what just happened. And I just, it was one of those things. Um, I'm a big reader of philosophy and, you know, existential stuff and stoicism and that sort of thing. And it was one of those moments, Mike, where like, I just said, hey, I wonder, like, now that I've stared at the abyss and I'm basically dead, like, can I come back? And if I can come back, how far can I come back? So, like the science nerd that I am, it was just kind of like a science experiment, right? Like, I became my own control group to see how far I could come back. And I tried every stupid thing under the sun, like every fasting hack, every keto hack, every everything along the way. And there's a reason it took 11 or 12 years to really get to a point of like, this is, this is where I'm at. It's because I did a lot of stupid stuff because there weren't really a lot of resources out there. These kinds of conferences didn't exist. And the closest thing you had was an occasional podcast with somebody or something along those lines you know, an occasional forum somewhere that was kind of a vestige of like the Atkins movement from the early 90s or whatever, and there was just that. So you picked up Wild McDonald's, the ketogenic diet book on the internet and PDF form and read that monster and then was actually going through school at the time, so I had access to a scientific library, so I grabbed uh, every single reference study that he cited in that book and began to read through the reference material. So read through all the Finney stuff and the Volick stuff and um, you know a number of the older studies that were being cited even in the Finney papers. And so, you know, 13 plus years later, you know, 1.6-ish million pounds later, which is where we are. Can you keep that, by the way? Can I be fucked now? What's that? I'm sure she is. It's all good. Uh, Amazing. Thank you. No, no worries. That that's, is, that's as good you as sound I like do. A, you sound like an old Model T trying to start, but somebody <laughs> didn't like crank the engine well enough. But Chitty, uh, chitty bang bang, yeah. yeah. Okay, nice. What's your website? Uh, it's just www.ketogains.com. Ketogains.com. Mm -hmm. Not with an S, not a Z. Yeah. As cool as that would be. But yeah, apparently we don't live in the 90s. <laughs> so <laughs> extreme without the E. Thank you so much for sharing. That's amazing. Again, uh, breakout session uh, Friday tomorrow at, at noon. At yeah, uh, you'll have you'll have to either skip your lunch or bring your lunch if you're yeah. going to hang out here. It's like twelve forty-five, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Tyler. Wow. All right. Wow. Oh, this is fabulous. Yeah. Who's uh, who's up next? Come on up. Yeah. yeah. Abby, would you, can I ask you? Would you give me a glass of water? Yes. Oh, sure. Thank you so much. What would you like in it? Well, I heard salt. Salt, salt would be great, but I don't know if you've got that handy. Oh, Kim, come on no. up. Let's hear your story. Kim, where are you from? Um, Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, wonderful. But we have a boat in, oh, we're so blessed. We have a boat in San Diego. Nice. And I love yeah. That's my favorite color. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we get to stay on it for the summer. It's really cool. So I get to have this beautiful weather. Um, I grew up not having really any health issues, except when I was young. I had arthritis all the time, but then got married and had kids. and. Felt great. I did um, not vegan. I tried vegan, but it didn't work. I did high. I would say high carb, low fat. I was swore that you know that's what's going to keep me going. <laughs> then I hit menopause, and I'm 63, and I was like, oh my god, this is not working. I gained a lot of weight. Um, put on weight for the last 12 years. In 09, I was in a really bad car accident and broke a vertebrae, fractured my both wrists, my hand. I had to have multiple surgeries, and the weight just oh my gosh, started climbing, um, menopause and the accident, <laughs> and just struggled, struggled. Well, I went to a doctor a year ago, somebody recommended, and Adam Nally, I don't know if any of you are familiar with him, he is in Phoenix, and he recommended I do the keto. Well, when I first heard it, I thought, no. <laughs> I've been my whole life doing low fat. How can you, <laughs> high fat just kind of scared me. And so the last year, I played with it, and I would try it a little bit, and I actually came low carb last year. And it was funny, when I heard Low Carb USA, I thought, oh, it's just gonna be low carb. I know all about Atkins, you know. Didn't know that so many people would be doing high fat, you know, moderate protein, high fat. I was shocked, so I thought, you know, this validates what my doctors said. <laughs> all these people, I heard all these success stories. So I really wanted to 
get on the program and stick with it. And unfortunately, I didn't. Christmas come and I got off track. And then um, after Christmas, we went to Hawaii for two weeks and my daughter was with us and she, unfortunately, I let her dietary influence, I didn't stick to the low carb. I started right after Christmas and then, or I should say keto, and I was on it until we went to Hawaii in the January. And once we went to Hawaii, I ate, I swear it's hard to eat. I don't know. I thought it was hard to eat low carb in Hawaii. <laughs> or at least that was my opinion then. Now I could go back and do it. But I um, ate every carb there was known to man in Hawaii. <laughs> Everybody served rice. And it was just like, oh my gosh. So I, I felt really crappy. And I came back. I was like, I'm going to start on my keto journey again. And I didn't. And then um, eight weeks ago, on a Sunday, we were at a friend's house, and um, she does low carb too, and I didn't even know she went to my doctor, <laughs> or keto. And um, she, I told her, you know, I don't want the baked potato. We had steak and asparagus, and you know, I said, I'm just gonna stick with the uh, steak and asparagus. And she said, that's great, that's great, I'm glad you're doing that. And uh, the next day, we went to Costco, and I thought, well, I'm gonna go to Costco and stock up. You all probably watched those videos about Costco balls on keto. So I'm gonna go stock up at Costco. We were walking in the middle of Costco, and my legs from my waist down went numb. I couldn't walk. My husband had to help me get to the food court, or the food area, and then he helped me get out to the car. Went to urgent care the next day. They diagnosed me with diabetic neuropathy, and I thought, there's just no way. I, my, a year ago, my blood sugar was really good. And I went to Dr. Nally the next day, and he was really great. He didn't lecture me on um, and I'm using a cane. As soon as we got home, my husband found my grandma's cane I had had for <laughs> 10 years. And that's the only way I could walk. So eight weeks ago, I was walking with a cane. And I had started keto the day before. And I thought, well, if anything I'm doing, keto might help. And here I am walking without a cane. Wow. Um, it's taken eight weeks for my, my numbness. And I'm totally numb still in my, from my ankles down, my feet. I can't feel anything on my feet. Um, I'm grateful I can walk. But my, I had chronic low back pain since 09 because I fractured a vertebrae. And one of my doctors, I went to a neurologist, she said, well, you could have um, inflammation from that vertebrae and that it could be causing your numbness. And it scared the crap on me. I had anxiety attack like no other. <laughs> Thinking, oh my God, am I gonna be this way? They want rule out MS, any autoimmune disorder. And that all came out fine. She thinks it's my vertebrae that I fractured causing ne neurological issues. So anyway, it's, I, I believe, and Dr. Nally was really good, he goes, well, you know, it's not life-threatening. <laughs> You're okay, you're not having a heart, a stroke. So um, I've watched myself get better over eight weeks, and I'm walking, not normal, but <laughs> as good as, you know, expected, and the pain in my back in eight weeks has diminished so much. And I'm so grateful, and I think this experience, why do we have to get to where we have something true? you know, um, life <laughs> changing like that to realize, okay, I need to do this for life. And I, and the bonus, I've dropped 20 pounds in eight weeks. Oh, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. Was, I'm so glad you're here because you're gonna feel, this is your tribe, right. and you're gonna feel so much more resolve and motivation to keep yes. going with what you're doing. Yes. Being, you know, everybody goes to these conferences and you're hugging at the end of this, your yeah. family. And uh, other people have been to other types of conferences, reflect on how you don't experience that at a photography conference. No. <laughs> uh, but here, you're just, you're gonna feel so much more motivation and excited to keep going. So congrats on all your success, and thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. I'm just gonna show the camera really quickly, because people are gonna wonder what I just took. <laughs> it's not, it actually, it's a, it sells pill bottle, or what does it say on there? Uh, pill bottle, but it's actually little um, chunks of Himalayan pink salt that somebody gave me in the audience here, which is wonderful. So, oh, it's the Redmonds, okay, awesome. It's my favorite kind, thank you so much. So I'm sitting here, it's actually pretty warm and, and I feel myself sweating and feeling thirsty, but just that little bit of water and that salt was perfect, so thank you so much. All right, um, let me check the time here. So um, we're at about, it's about 11, isn't it? Is that about right? Yeah. Um, so we have, let's, let's do maybe one or two more stories. And yeah, come on up. Doug's gonna do opening ceremonies, I think at 11.30. Um, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we'll go in another 15 minutes or so. Thank you so much. Uh, Peggy, where are you from? I am from Anaheim, California. 
I don't have a great story. I'm an old lady. I'm me and Abby are almost the same. We're, I'm 67, and she, I've been married almost 50 years. My husband doesn't do keto. Um, I started keto in June a year ago, and I consider myself a PA. I'm practicing at it because I don't get the whole macros. I mean, I do my best, but I have lost 100 pounds. Oh my gosh. And I don't have a fantastic story. <laughs> But I, I uh, started in January that a year ago, and I just was, uh, my goal was to lower my blood pressure, mm -hmm. because I do have the high blood pressure. I don't like doctors, I don't go to doctors. If there's any in here, I'm sorry, but <laughs> nothing personal. But, um, so it was, probably well, six, almost six months of me trying to lose weight, lower my blood pressure, so I cut out salt, I cut out all fats, I was eating oatmeal with um, non-fat milk and chicken breast broiled or boiled and you know broccoli with nothing on it, no salt, no butter, no nothing. So my sexual experience came when I started keto and I could put cream in my coffee <laughs> and butter on my broccoli. So <laughs> that's when I was, you know, just thought the world was wonderful. And since then, that's just kind of what I do. I, I change it up when I go for a little while and then that doesn't seem to be working anymore. Then I either add more fat or take away fat or add more protein or story. Oh, that's wonderful. Congrats on your success. Any you. questions? Yeah, Abby. Okay, so the relationship and everybody eats their own thing and you're cooking your own. How, does it, how do you handle it? How, do, how does your uh, differing food styles from your husband? I just cook for him the way he eats and I cook for me the way I eat and it's okay. I mean, I just made my grandson a triple decker chocolate cake for his eighth grade graduation and <laughs> You know, because uh, I can't force them to do what I'm doing. Do you find yourself when you're with friends or other people that you you're on a soapbox and, and you and you talk about it, or how do you handle that? Because you're you you role model, you're a fabulous role model. I, I talk about it a little bit to them. Um, they all are waiting for me to drop dead with a heart attack because of I'm, all that fat I'm eating and my bacon and my you know. So they're starting to come around now that I've been doing it a year and I haven't dropped dead yet. So uh, they're starting to ask more questions, but it's been kind of slow. And do you eat out a lot? No, I don't. I, but that's just, even when I was heavy, I didn't eat out a lot. I'm just kind of here. I'm a homebody. <laughs> so uh, your, your opening is, I don't have a story. And you know, to, to use the term here, you just, dropped an F-bomb on us. <laughs> it's like, what, what, you know, like, what do you mean? It's like, there's an incredible story there. For example, what, what, how did your biomarkers change? Yeah, how did your biomarkers change? Oh, because she doesn't go to doctors. I don't go to doctors, so I don't know. How about your blood, blood pressure? I do take my, my blood pressure is coming down. It's not probably where a doctor would like it to be, but it's way lower than it is, and I don't take any medication anymore for it. I quit when, I know that's bad, and everybody's going to say that's bad. But can I ask another question? Sure, great. Uh, so, um, uh, I spend a lot of time trying to educate my doctor, and I go in with ten pages of stuff. This is what I'm doing, and here, here's the, the the supporting hyperlinks to, to support it. And so, I don't I don't want to tell you what to do, but I'm just questioning, you know, why I don't find somebody. I mean. You have one of the greatest doctors in this community, in this town. Uh, I don't live in this town, though. <laughs> you're, you're, you're a lot closer than I am. I'm just saying, I, I, I'm just saying, I got a doctor now who, he's keto, he's... Uh, and you know, I will so. look for a keto doctor soon. I mean, I, this is all still, I feel new to me. I, I still feel like I'm learning, you know, and I learn every day. I, not to start any rumors, I sleep with... Gary Tobbs every night in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I'm constantly listening, learning, and reading, and, and trying to figure this all out. But I, I feel great. 
I have more energy than I've ever had. I was born without hip sockets. I had my first um, hip replacement when I was nine years old. Mm. I have stainless steel screws holding my kneecaps on because they can fall off at random, mm. randomly. <laughs> so um, my disdain for doctors comes from, you know, like a lot of experience with them, I guess. Mm. So. Exercise? Uh, you know what? I'm going to do that. I haven't yet. <laughs> I, I am trying to walk a little more, and but again, because of my hips, I... Um, but the 100 pounds was not with exercise? It was, it was not with exercise. I don't know. Not with exercise. I'm going to talk, hopefully, Ben while I'm here this oh. weekend and uh, <laughs> see what he can do to point me in the right direction on. Thank you so much. And I think Greg, Greg is seeing a missed opportunity. He sees it as you can help change doctors in this world by sharing your yeah, experiences. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I realize that now, and that you know, but I just like I said, every time I go to a doctor, they want to slice and dice something. So, I, uh, so in a different world, uh, I do a philosophy class, and uh, one of the greatest things about being an American that I've learned from this class is what there is for us to do is is be useful to other Americans in the world. And the, you know, and, and the story that you have is incredible. And it's like, it, it, isn't, it, it, it isn't even about you, it's about us. Like, we need you out there. Like, come out from the shadows. Well, that's why I'm yeah. here. <laughs> well, this is, the, this yeah. is the great thing, Greg, is that not only in this room of people, but this is gonna go out on YouTube, yeah. and my 6,000 subscribers will see it, but also it's gonna get shared out and shared out and shared out. So she is actually it's being here, and she's going to be impacting much more people than just sharing with her doctor, so. Right. I, I Thank I you. See, I hope I don't seem critical. I oh, no, just, no, not at all. You, you are we need a, a diamond, and uh -huh. not in the rough. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, I just, it's my past experience with doctors, which is kind of, lended me to, and my husband too. My husband had a heart attack, um, gosh, almost 20 years ago now, and he is just on a litany of medications. I mean, there's a list that's as long as my arm. Oh. And um, he refuses to change his diet, and he still smokes. He's quit smoking, and now he's on to vaping, which I guess is the thing to do. And um, you know, Maybe he, he eats uh, Fritos and nacho cheese mm -hmm. every night almost, and, and you know, it's just crazy. And yet, he thinks if he takes his magic pill, he's going to live forever. And I love him dearly. I mean, we've been married almost fifty years, but um, it's passing. You know, they they just don't. They just keep thinking if they could take a pill for it, and I'm kind of the opposite. I don't want to take any pills, things. So, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you Peggy. Thank You're you. Welcome. <laughs> and I'll take my salt.